Hey everybody, welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. I have a, such a great guest today with JJ Farris from Slam and Gladys, and he's got a very successful career in licensing. Uh, super nice guy. I just want to thank him publicly for, I had to move our appointment a few times. He's been uh, really nice and flexible, so thanks. Uh, I want to thank also Melissa Kusarek for connecting us, and uh, as always, she's really great. Uh, make sure, you, one quick announcement, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the show. If you're already watching us on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and the little emoji that looks like a bell that helps us get recommended by YouTube. And thanks for your support. Uh, quickly about JJ's background, multi-instrumentalist. He's got decades of experience playing in rock bands, high profile session gigs, as well as creating custom music and sound design. He's originally from Cleveland and he moved to LA to start his musical journey. He's been the lead guitarist and lead vocalist of several successful bands, including Red 37, The Tories and Slam and Gladys. Slam and Gladys just released their second album called Two, which we'll talk about today. Uh, now, JC's got a real successful career in licensing, as I said. In 2002, he founded Real Music. It's R-E-E-L Music. And that's evolved into a massive library of music available to license to the advertising world. Uh, the company also provides scores and underscores for major motion pictures and TV shows like Irresistible, The New Mad Max, Jason Bourne, Smurfs, Dateline, Ocean's 8, Terminator, Dark Fate, Goosebumps, and like hundreds of other you know, top shelf movies. Uh, and this is cool. JJ also works with singer songwriters from all over the world, collaborating on cover songs with them that sound nothing like the original versions. In other words, you have arrangements that you, you know, like working with JJ do that, that makes sense that he could place in his library. The covers often exist to provide movie and TV shows. Like if you ever heard a cover of the Beatles, a, a Beatles song, and you're wondering, well, why didn't they use the Beatles track? It's because the Beatles track would cost a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. The cover track, maybe not, you know? So JJ specializes in working with people to create these uh, songs. And then he has a library that makes them available to you. So anyway, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. I so appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, Craig, thank you for having me, man. My pleasure. Uh, one question that I did not put, on the questions, what happened at Westlake Audio when you almost got your car stolen? Oh man! Uh, <laughs> Do you remember this? Doing. Um, I'm trying to remember this, man. That was a long time ago. Yeah, we were making the album. Uh, we, we got in there um, through our producer's wife worked at Westlake and stuff. And I'm trying to remember how my car got stolen. Maybe you know this story. So you're watching a. <laughs> the, the, you're on you're doing some recording and all of a sudden there's a video oh yeah they recorded, <laughs> they recorded it like from the day before it's right they there was a video you, screen down in the parking lot and they had they had uh they had uh, <laughs> uh like pre the night before when i was leaving or whatever you know and they they replayed the tape yeah and i'm sitting there playing like oh shit <laughs> i asked joe i said Dude, thank you for reminding me of that that's cool I, I completely forgot about that when i saw that joe did your first record i said hey man give me a funny story to tell JJ oh, and he said okay I completely <laughs> forgot about that great <laughs> well right on thank you Joe all right man how'd you first get started in the music business JJ and what was like your first break um you know I, I guess um in getting first started in the music business I would think that kind of um coming to Los Angeles you know in general was my first start I mean I grew up in Ohio I remember the day that I got my um a rejection letter from Berkeley because I applied for Berkeley in Boston first and I wanted to go there. I was a real big, you know, follower of the whole, I was really into Steve I at the time and Satriani and that whole world of the Berkeley kind of sounding influence. And I applied there, I applied late and um, I didn't have great grades. So I remember the day I got my rejection letter, I literally looked at it and I looked up at my mom and I say, mom, I'm going to California. Like in an instant, I like just in a flash made up my mind and literally like a month later i was driving to california it was such a quick decision um so that's kind of i would think of how it started um in general um you what know, made you like did you had you been thinking about that or is that just like your knee-jerk reaction once you got that letter or i had been thinking about california i mean i i i through the whole MTV generation, I was a big fan of California bands. I was a big fan of like Dokken and Rat and, um, you know, the whole Ozzy thing and just all this L.A., um, you know, L.A. music that was just it was just Motley Crue, um, just anything that was L.A. at the time. That was my generation. And it just was moving. I just wanted to be part of that. I wanted to be in L.A. I wanted to, you know, I knew quickly that Cleveland was a short leash for me. I just knew quickly. Yeah. I, I, I knew at 16 that I was 
I wasn't even really out. I wasn't even exhausting the area yet. And I knew, <laughs> I knew it was going to be exhausting before I even went there. So I kind of made a quick decision that I needed to, to make bigger decisions to kind of succeed out of this little place that I was growing up in. That's really, I, I think that's really cool. How did you like, what, how did you put that together? That's at a young age, you know, that's not easy to, I don't know. I just kind of looked around me. I noticed that uh, the kind of music that I wanted to do was also the scene because uh, the Cleveland scene in Cleveland was a little bit more metal and okay. it was a little bit more darker, kind of not really melodic and stuff. And then um, there was this other scene in Akron, Akron, Ohio, it was the Akron Agora. And I used to go see Dave play there all the time and, um, from Slam and Gladys. And he was in a band called Gotham City at the time. I used to watch them. I used to sneak in with my fake ID and sit there and awe and watch, wow, this guy's a great singer. And I knew he was great. And I wanted to be in a band with him, but everybody else around, there was a couple other bands that were good, a couple other good singers. But I knew that the talent pool, I just wanted to be around, I don't know. I just wanted to, I wanted to be around just a bigger, I just wanted to be around bigger fish. I don't know how to describe it. It's just yeah, yeah. something that I just felt very strongly about so adamantly that I left in Cleveland at 18, being an only child, I just left. Wow. <laughs> you know, um, just like I was that determined, you know, and I never, never looked back. I haven't ever looked back. <clears throat> Were you always that ambitious or is that the start of you becoming ambitious? That was the, the big start of it. That was the risk, you know. Um, I tell people often that the difference between that decision that I made and not making it is a, it's a, it's everything. Those, those chances and those risks are very, very hard to do. And I think, I think um, the fact that I was able to do that at a young age was, was, was pretty special now that I look back at it. Oh yeah. I, went out, I came out, I went to MI um, and halfway through this, through the year of GIT, um, I was in a band called Biloxi. I was playing at the Troubadour, like halfway through my year. I like, I already, I already like, I saw school. I go, I don't want to be a shredder. I don't care about playing like Paul Gilbert. I love Paul Gilbert, but I don't want to play like him. I want to just learn. I want to just kind of get better. And then halfway through the year, I was playing in the Troubadour and we were going, um, you know, pretty much every month I was in a band called Biloxi, um, local band. And so, yeah, so it was just really driven, man. I uh, just really, I said to myself, if I'm going to leave my house, leave my parents, leave everything behind. I got to do something, man. Yeah. I make something happen. I don't want to like, I don't want to like not make something happen, you know? So. But what you said, that's a really important thing that people don't often, that if people are scared to do, you know, whenever you take a chance, you have to take a risk. Yeah. There's no success without taking a risk for the most part. You know, it's usually like it's not risk free. That's why so few people be few people become successful because they're not willing to take the risk. Dude, you so. got to you got to just constantly, constantly do Const take risks and constantly put yourself in positions that are are challenging and something that you just automatically can't do with your eyes closed. You got to challenge yourself constantly. You know, totally. I've, I've made a point my whole life of um. And I preach about this too. Surrounding yourself with people that are way more talented than you. Like always, I always yeah. do that. I mean, I don't want to be the best, the big guy in the room. I don't want to be the best player or the best producer. I want to be in the room where I'm not the best. I'm, I'm looking to, to learn. I'm looking to, to understand. I'm looking to learn new tips. I'm looking to like, just be better. You know, that's kind of the mentality I think going into it. I agree with you. If you're looking up, that's where you get that stuff. If you're the smartest dude in the room, it ain't going to happen, man. I, I totally yeah, man, agree I've, with you. I've learned just, amazing lessons from so many peers you know that i've been so fortunate just to be in the room with and that's that's everything that's how you learn going to school it can teach you so much real life experience is everything especially in anything with music you gotta you gotta do it man yeah. and we talk about it all day you know I, I remember when i was a kid i read an article about practicing guitar in your room um for as a one gig, one playing one show live is equivalent to practicing for two weeks straight in your room all day. As, as far you, as your growth, that was like in my mind, like, and I kind of set, I set that standard in my head, you know, um, like to, to like get there. Cause I was, a, I was afraid to play, man. When I went to MI, um, one of my biggest challenges was trying to get over the fear of being on stage, you know, and trying to, and then also to sing lead on stage. So like at the end of my school year, my big pinnacle moment was I got to be on stage with a really good guitar player named Jay. She was amazing, a good friend, and uh, Jay Fouché. And, um, and we kind of became buddies. We did this really cool original song, and I sang lead. And I remember that feeling, like, doing that. It was like this, oh, you know, like, God, I finally did it. And that was, that was what I needed, man. I needed to get that off my shoulders. Because when you're the kid practicing in your room, like I was, like, literally four or five hours a day every day, 
um, that doesn't get you, you know, to the next level as much as actually doing it. Yeah, man. I totally agree with you on anything you do. Uh, uh, side question. Do you happen to know a guy named Dave Baker from Cleveland? I do not. Okay. Just curious. Um, all right. How did you, once you got out to LA, how did you get things going? I mean, you, you're playing at the Troubadour. How did, how did things pick up for you? I mean, it, you got to be pro. I mean, you had to be proactively involved in that. Yeah. Well. I mean, I was doing the Troubadour with the Spambo Oxy and then um, I always kept in touch with, um, um, well, Dave, Dave Brooks from Slam and Gladys and an original drummer, his name was Johnny Fedovich. Actually, the original drummer was the drummer from, uh, almost famous, the guy in the plane as oh, the plane. Really? <laughs> That's, that, that was, he was our original drummer. He's a great guy, but, uh, he, 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 um, actually we did a gig and, um, and he kind of just took his stuff and went, went back and, and I kind of lost the question a little bit. Tell remind me again. I, I it was, how did you get traction in LA once you got um, here? Yeah. Okay. Here's what I was going to say. So, so I kept in, in touch with Johnny and um, I knew Dave and those guys were out here. And I, like I said, back in the day, I always wanted to be in a band with Dave. I thought he was the greatest singer ever. Um, so I kept in touch and I just called John one day and I said, Hey dude, what are you up to? He's like, Oh man, just hanging out. We, you know, we're just auditioning guitar players. You know, we got a, our guitar player quit. I'm like, really? And I literally, this is, I do this to this day. I, I, I take my phone and I'll put it by a speaker and I'll play. So I still do this all the time, whether it's a song, a guitar part. Um, so I put the phone by the, by the amp and I, whatever riff I was playing right at that moment or that, that day, I just go, Dum, whatever. I played a riff and, and he's like, dude, you should come audition for the band. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, and that was, that was kind of it. I remember the first audition I went in there, it went really well. And Dave said to me, he's like, well, he goes, you can either join our band and play your own songs, or you can stay in that guy's band and play all his songs. Okay. <laughs> That's a pretty compelling offer when you put it to you like that, right? Yeah. So that was it. So I joined, so that was kind of like yeah, how I first, that was it. And then right away we started playing, we started doing these profile shows. The band was originally called Risque back in the day. And we were associated with um, Janie Lane at the time because um, Warrant was friends and Janie was friends with them. Um, you know, our bass player, Al Collins, he was in a band with Janie called Plain Jane, um, you know, prior to any of this um, back in the back in the Sunset Strip days. So, yeah, long story short. So it was just a culmination of all these great um, events that were happening. But Slam and Gladys definitely um, eventually got the deal with uh, with Priority Records. And um, then we went out, we just toured, man, for like toured with Warren, toured with South Gang, toured with like all these great bands and just just got our well we were like a machine you know just out there playing it was great it was a great experience what 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 at a certain point what happened because i mean it, so, it was obviously a while between the first album and this one what yeah. did you guys just to say decide to put quit or for oh, now well, or the I record remember we were out in the middle of oklahoma and uh, i remember our, our record label literally said give us your publishing or we're going to pull your tour support and we did that. What? I mean, we, we, we pulled our tour support. Yeah. Um, and that was it. That was Holy kind of it. Shit. Yeah. We I hear out. this stuff like this all the time. Yeah, we like... were out, um, we were out, we were in the middle of Oklahoma somewhere. And I remember being, and I remember that call and I remember that was it. All money pulled tour over, go back home. And then after that, we just kind of floundered for a bit, made a, made some more recordings. And then we kind of just dissolved the band just kind of, you know, naturally just dissolved in its own way. Um, um, so it was kind of sad that it had to happen like that. Cause we never really had our, you know, we, we never really had our fair due, yeah. um, back in the day. but also, you know, things were changing also too. We were just on the cusp of this whole grunge thing. I mean, 92, we were, we were literally just, I mean, it was changing and we couldn't, <laughs> there's nothing we could do about it. We were yeah. about five years late in our game, you know, unfortunately. So I think because of that and also because of maybe other reasons that we weren't aware of that they just kind of pulled it on us. And, and that was where we were left. So it was, it was an experience, but. Wow. I can't believe, give us your pub. That's like, yeah. <laughs> like the most disgusting, like ethic yeah. business ethics. Yeah. Hey man, yeah, you guys are doing this, great. This, give this, us this, all your money or yeah. you're done. And this was done by the guy that uh, that made all his money on the California raisins. And, you know, this is the guy that that, you know, made all his money on NWA and, and, and Easy E and all this rap stuff, which he had no clue about. But he knew how to he was a business guy. So he, wow. he knew how to do it. So he was trying to. Yeah, it was it was scary, man. It was like, we're not we don't want to give our publishing for to you. <laughs> You're not a publisher. You're just. Yeah. I mean, what? <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. So yeah, that stems from you know, there, there should have been something in the, in the deal that 
that attorney should have written that that could never happen. But you know, you live and you learn. And that was a, the first deal when you're super young, you know. Now, if I what I read is accurate, something similar happened at the Tories because you guys were doing great got a record deal and then same thing got caught up in some uh, record company issues um yeah it was they, that was a, a brand new record company it was on it was on wall street um in the wall street district in new york and um it was like a it, it, it was it, the whole thing that was interesting about that is itunes and all the digital and, and all the music was transferring from well like card copies and and to like did, everything was slowly going and they were right on the cusp but yeah they were talking about all oh, how everything is now they were all talking about that and they never had the staff or the knowledge unfortunately at that time to kind of pull it together in a, in a fashion where it was positive for everybody yeah. so again we had a great experience we made our record with phil ramon um who's one of the you know most well-renowned amazing people um that you can ever want to meet um, in the music industry. And um, so um, we went to Compass Point in the Bahamas, made our album. Um, it That's was right. A crazy experience, you know. Um, but um, yeah, it just wasn't the right time again. You know, it's 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 all about timing, man. It really is. I mean, look how many talented people there are in the in, in, in just people that maybe you meet or I meet or any. Oh, just God, around. yeah. And it's just like, it's just about, it's just about timing and it's, it's about breaks and it's about timing. And, and, the, and unfortunately the Tories just weren't, were ready. I remember we, um, we did a showcase for Phil Jameson from RCA at the China club and we opened up for Dada and at the China club in New York showcased for Phil Jameson. Uh, Brian Maloof had just um, remixed our single. Um, now when it appears, it sounded amazing. We thought we were all good and we were ready to go on RCA. We we're going to get signed, man. Just like we made an amazing show and it just didn't happen. It wasn't just wow. didn't happen. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, we, we, we had a really big buzz. The Tories had the big buzz when I joined the band. Well, my first show was at the house of blues in front of a thousand people. It was like, I was, I jumped right into this thing That's you know cool. so it was, it was pretty neat you know to be part of that and then get the deal and then we did a vh1 rock across america tour 40 days opening up for cheap trick um on vh1 that was like that had to be awesome life. yeah like i used to air a guitar dream police in my bedroom <laughs> here i am like i'm rick nielsen's flipping me off you know <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool yeah yeah so it's kind of neat okay so now if what if what i read is correct also that whole event though led you to first get into licensing is that is that accurate yeah um the tories was um the start of it we um we were playing the troubadour um we had just toured for probably like a year and a half well, about a little over a year we were super tight man like we, we didn't have to look at one another we didn't have to look at our instruments we were just so tight from playing and then we played the troubadour and we were approached by a guy named gavin mckillop who was the producer who did the i'll be there for you for the friends theme he was hired by nbc to find a band for the new show jesse that was coming on with christine applegate for nbc so literally we're playing our show and um after the show's over we get approached by gavin mckillop he's like hey man great show I'm like thanks he's like what do you guys think about uh writing a theme song for a tv show you guys into that i'm like uh okay <laughs> You know, like we didn't have any idea how hard it was to get a theme at the time. And so here we are two weeks later, we're in the studio with like Kevin Bright, one of the producers from Friends. He's in there like a little kid, like he's a music kid. He's like, come on, more energy. We need more energy. He's like going like, holy shit. You know, here we are. You know, we ended up being the Friends. We played all the Friends parties. We played in the stage in the back lots. So we got to meet all the crew. Like it was just crazy, dude. Like really cool. So that was like. We used to see, I used to hear our theme song, which I, I fortunately was part of writing with our singer, Steve. And um, we, we used to hear the theme song on TV every week. And I was like, oh my God. And then we did the underscore for the show too. So we would go to a studio and then we would just come up with, okay, okay, cool. Like we do these little bumpers, you know, we make yeah, like yeah. 50 or a hundred bumpers and then we would uh, let the post do what they did. We didn't get involved with the post. We just came in, played. And then, so we were the underscore, we were the theme, we were the, all the music. So that that kind of opened me up to this 20 million people a week were listening to our song because it was right after Friends and um, on NBC. And then we would tour and like people would be come up to us and say, uh, time to be all the things. And they would, <laughs> think, they would think like, like, holy shit, these like how powerful is television? This is like before American Idol. And yeah. Um, so we were, you know, we were kind of riding these waves. And I saw the power of TV. I'm like, oh my 
God. And there was, you know, so a little money came with it. I was going to say, um, man, you're getting that. And, nice and I'm like, okay, this is interesting. I can make money. And this is so satisfying hearing my stuff on hearing our music on TV. Wow. Yeah. Like every week I would tune in and just be blown away. Like here's our stuff, like the whole show. And, and so I started getting proactive with library companies. I started working with a company called BRG music out of Philadelphia. That's the first company, a guy named Andy Mark. He's not with us anymore, but he was really generous to me. And he started me off with library music, like 200 bucks a cue. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just go for it. They sucked. It was awful. Um, but then I got hooked up with a company called Video Helper, which was another New York company. And that's what kind of really started. They were another level. So, you know, it was, it was a big pull of chain of events. Yeah. And, and you slowly learned how to score to a picture through, th through this, which is not well, easy. That, yeah, that, that that was a whole nother um since i was a kid i've always been fascinated with recording i've always multi-tracked i used to multi-track on my cassette recorder with a microphone i used to do all that always been fascinated i was always the guy with the studio and everything but you know um it, it basically uh it remind me again of like i can't i, I lost my train of thought there. no Sorry. it's all good <laughs> i i said you through doing these you learned how to how to write score to a moving picture yeah, like so. So scoring to a moving picture, what I what I did is I started learning by having editors send me things, and I worked with this guy named Jonas, who's another composer, great composer, and I I, I started noticing how he would score, and he would be very conscious of the dialogue, and he'd be very conscious of inflections, and he would just run and repeat things, and I would see this thing and why it worked, and how how to interweave what you're doing with the actual picture not to take over but just to enhance and just to kind of like bring a different life so we, we scored a couple of movies together i did a, a movie called the believer which was a about coach steve spurrier of the sec sure um did a did a film about his life um it was great so we got to like i got to watch jonas work there and then we did another another film together and i just just watching him was really beneficial to me to understand how to work with picture and then i also learned from just doing um underscore for like television shows and stuff and what was working for like i did a lot of stuff for abc like 2020 would drop my cues behind the show and like all these things and i would just notice how it would work with the drama and why it worked and why it was being used and just trying to learn you know that whole craft of like what works and you know like what is this art and it's it's it's, it's a whole different art man it's such a different thing than just playing or, or recording you know um it's such such a different muscle to, to flex obviously you liked it though because you've done very well with it you know what's interesting about that i don't i i would think i would say probably 25 percent of the time i actually get picture um the other 75 percent, it's all here it's all here i have to literally try to imagine what the cue that i'm writing for the film i might be like for the um for the trailer for the film or what have you or for the television show i have to kind of imagine what it's supposed to wait be a minute like. they don't get how do they not how do they expect you to score to a you, you picture, basically, but they don't give you well, the well scoring um when you're scoring a film that's different you're going to get a picture because that's essential but most of the trailers that i do you don't actually get the trailer video because they okay it's such a sacred thing they stop they stop sending out there is i still do like i said 25 percent of the time depending on the clients i still do get sent picture but in general um it's it's mainly what's in your imagination to kind of to kind of bring to life what you're trying to do, which is something I had to learn how to do. Um, now, when I, when I work on something, man, I literally, like at the end, I'll close my eyes and I'll just kind of listen to the back and I'll you like it loud usually at the end. And then if I don't, if I can't go, like if it doesn't take me to a journey somewhere where I'm meant to be, then I have to start over or I have to keep tweaking or I have to do, I know there's a visual, a visual place where it has to be before I feel like it's right. And that, took years to kind of get and develop and that goes back to albie glute and the guy uh, the gentleman i mentioned yeah. before the guitars because we were at a party one time and he told me yeah i visualized the whole orchestra and i visualized the whole song before i record this is when i was like naive and dumb i'm like no what do you mean you visualize the whole thing like yeah i visualized the this part and that and like and then we had this little argument about it like not an argument but i was kind of debating it i was like what do you mean i don't have to visualize i do this without visualize and and so later on you, you learn the visualization it's such a powerful thing it's everything even if you do have picture you still have to visualize but 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 most generally visualizing without picture really helps you develop that 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 um art or that craft 
but they'll tell you what this what what the theme is or the storyline yeah. like yeah. this is a mom and her two kids yeah. sitting okay. oh yeah oh yeah so you, you, have, get everything. Okay. you get the whole synopsis you'll get a brief from the client um from the studio you'll get specific details you'll have examples of other um music examples that they pulled that they like the feel of we want it to be like this but not like this <laughs> yeah yeah so. What made you start a library? Because there's so many different ways you can get into licensing and sync, but you, you actually set up a library, which is a lot of work. We, well, I've, I've created multiple libraries over the years. Um, I, right now, as we speak, there's libraries that myself and other people I work with in the trailer industry we've created that actually sit at trailer houses as we speak. And trailers, editors, and soups are pulling daily. You know, they pull, throw it into their productions. And you can bless libraries. them. <laughs> the reason why I created them is because, well, I, I used to do for the library. I, I like when I first started with BR Music, helper and all these companies, I started writing for you know multiple cuts for all them and i started building their empires up all the time like wow i see how you know this powerful this is we're building up these guys these guys companies i want to build my own company i want to have my own library so i started um reaching out to other fellow composers and and just threw it out there listen it's really simple if i get a license we split it 50 50 i don't own your queue i don't want to own your queue it's simple it's like i don't want to get into the publishing thing sure. it's a really easy deal with me i just whatever i do we just split it's easy right right um, and that makes it simple for people to come on board and stuff. So yeah, the reason why I did it is because there's content is key. If you don't have content, you can't really survive. You have to have content. You gotta totally. have you gotta have special effects, you gotta have emotional pads, you gotta have piano things, you gotta have strength. You, get, you have to have content. Um, so so you're ready for any kind of if you get that call and this person's looking for that not only can you score a custom, but you have five things you can maybe throw their way that are just, just ready to go. Cause if you don't have those five things, your chances are very, very slim because there's not a lot of time to create custom music these days as there was at one point, you know, having stuff ready to go is a lot easier for. for oh, hell yeah. Plus you get all those ups, upsells as, as now you get a whole package that they're you're providing them with. And then, which is what people want. Yeah. You know, it's like going to a restaurant and all they sell is the appetizer you know yeah. you want the whole freaking meal you know yeah. and it's very i think it's very similar to that yeah. um kudos to you for doing that man for that you know uh do, did you like come from an entrepreneurial background at all um not really no my um uh, no I, I just just had a lot of drive a lot of desire I'm, I'm very influenced by sports figures um like the whole Kobe Bryant run, um, like back, my wife and I were at game six when they beat Philadelphia for that, when they won the second and the three P I, I, I find sports in the connection with sports and the competition, very, very, um, very personal to me, which drives me. I don't know how to describe it. It's weird. I'm very competitive, man. I always used to be that kid it used to be, the, you know, just the drive. I don't know. Mm. And I, I noticed at a young age that what I was doing was appealing. I used to have groups of people like watch me play guitar. I used to sit in my room, play guitar like 14, 15. And I had like five people, like people in the neighborhood that I didn't even know sometimes were in my room, like watching me play guitar. Like, wow, <laughs> like this is weird. You know, like um, I look around and I, I have crowds and I used to have crowds of people. I used to be the guy in the video game, like uh, at the video game thing playing Galaga. I used to be the guy that flipped it over 999,000. Galaga, I remember so that game. I was like that dude that flipped the game. And like I had like crowds of people like watching me do games so i was always intrigued by this this thing like wow you can attract people by just having fun what yeah. i can play video games and i can have people or i can be playing my guitar and so it's just a drive man um i can't describe the drive i um i feel like i'm 15 years old right now i'm still in the same mindset that i was <laughs> right, right. It's, and i can't it's weird you know I don't, I don't know how to describe it it's actually strange but what uh, what kind of work did your parents do um, my mom was a, um, uh, she was a beautician, a hairstylist uh, for pretty much, I mean, when she was young, she started really early. So she would always, you know, she would be really creative and in and, and style and cut hair and do all that. Dad was, a uh, um, got in the insurance business um, and he ended up being a manager of like 40, 50 people at Nationwide. So he had a really successful insurance career um, that he, he had. So they were, my dad was musical. My dad's side of the family is very musical, um, very great voices. My aunts are operatic singers. Um, oh, cool. My dad is a, a musician himself. He plays piano, um, never sought out um, music professionally, but, um, but definitely has a, a musical background. He sings great. He loves to sing Sinatra, you know, the whole thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. I have a big, uh, my, and my mom brought the soul. My mom's family is like, um, 
the, the heart and soul. And I feel like dad's family brought the music. So I have that, that beautiful combination that I was fortunate to get. Very cool, man. Nationwide is on your side. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. You know who wrote that theme, right? Who? Barry Manuel. Did he really? Yep. Wow. He, he you talk about the, royalty checks, he, man. He wrote all the things right there. He wrote uh, State Farm, all, all them, man. All, all that stuff. That is really wild. Yeah. Holy Check out his, yeah, his, uh, 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 yeah, Barry Manuel is the, the dude, man. He's the guy. He's like, he's like the theme. If you go back to the 70s and 80s, you, he has about probably 10 or 12 killer big profile themes. Wow. Do you, he, he's probably made as much money off that as he's made in his music oh, yeah. career. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Holy yeah. crap. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, interesting. Hey, let's talk about for a few minutes the new Slamming Gladys record. Uh, Great. Nine very cool blues rock tracks. Um, you wrote or co-wrote all the songs on that record. I just want to talk about a couple of those standouts I really enjoyed. Uh, first song, Durango, really pretty ballad. Your guitar is very clean in there, so I figured you were playing a Strat on that. You know, that's I, I saw that question. Actually, it's a telly. Um, I have a I have a really nice um, uh, 1960 reissue telly that was. Um, it was actually owned by a uh, Jimbo Barton producer that I, I bought it from him. And uh, it was one cool thing is Corey Taylor from Slipknot played it on a song called bother and whatever, oh, it doesn't cool. mean much, but it was just nostalgic somewhat to me. It's a beauty guitar. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a telly. It sounds like a strat, huh? <laughs> Real clean. Like, well, nice it was so clean, you know, I, yeah. and I'm, I'm, it's easier to pick out, uh, you know, telly only for me anyway, telly only screams telly if it's country. Right. It could be both, you know, either or. And I don't think in terms of telly. So that's why I said Strat. It's, it was clean as hell. It sounded great. You know, you know what's interesting about that? I remember I laid down, um, I doubled the guitar, just just like played through the song so so we can do the vocals, you know, just to kind of get it going so we can get it start with the vocals. And I, and I remember keeping those takes because they were really clean. I went back to replay it. I'm like, I don't I don't want to replay this. They sound, inter- they sound really cool. They sound nice, you know. Um, so I didn't have to go back and play those. So the first two takes were the were the main performances of the song. This is interesting. That's cool. Man. I What's wasn't that? really trying or thinking. <laughs> uh, it sounds good. What, what are you playing through in there? um you know it's funny man i have a secret amp that um I have, gonna tell. These, I have all these amps back here as you can see but <clears throat> the secret amp and the, the the crazy and i learned about this from uh, a guy named doug messenger in a studio in north hollywood we went to do a demo there and he had one of these amps it's a randall rg80 solid state really oh my god dude i mean okay so the story with this um it was a really big profile amp in the eighties. Randall was an eighties amp. Obviously this one's, this one was made. It was about a 11, $1,200 in its day. It was a really expensive amp, you know, and it's solid day. state, especially. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, and in the circuitry of which it was, I can't describe how it was built, but there's a sound to it that Mutt Lang, all the Def Leppard, U2. Um, I mean, you can go on the list of great guitars, George Lynch from Dokken, um, Like these, this, this is a staple amp on mo- a lot of the recordings and I was kind of like, whatever. So I played the amp. I went to the studio. I had my little rig that I brought. I, I came and he's the, the guy in the studio, Doug. He's like, can you just plug into this one? I want you to hear this amp. And I'm like, okay. I was, I was kind of laughing because it was a solid state Randall. I'm like, okay. Right. You know? And I literally plugged into it. I'm like, oh my God, like, are you kidding me? I mean, so I literally went home that day. I went online and I found one. I found one in uh, Brea, California. I found for 150 bucks. I found the RG80. It's got the 100 watt selection speaker, which you have to have. That's the most important thing. You got to have the 100 watt speaker. But I'm telling you, it is the secret. The whole Slam and Gladys album. I'd used. I didn't use anything else. I think I used the amp on the whole album. Wow, it sounded great the whole Literally. way through, man. And it has yeah. a certain kind of character because. I wanted to kind of create a character thing. Like I remember like when I was like, remember when Boston, when they, the the Schultz, the the Rockman, when that sound, like that sound came out, it had this distinctive like thing and the sound and and not to say that I I accomplished that much of distinctive, but I certainly wanted to go for something that was very, um, you know, unique and identifiable. So I kind of tried to stick with one amp through the whole thing. And it just kind of each guitar played its own kind of characteristic more than the amps did. Very cool. Randall RG80. Solid well, state. People don't know, man. It's the, If you get one, you'll die. You'll, you'll just plug in and I'm like, oh my God. 
You know, it's really weird. You mentioned Boston. I have heard on the last two weeks, like five Boston songs on, on new TV shows. It was really oh, wow. weird. I'm like, and I'm like, that's a lot of money to put one of those songs. You know, they played a long, uh, it's been such a long time. It's, what's the name of that song? Long time, right? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, I just heard it. Long time. Yeah. I just heard I it. Last... I should be going. Yeah. Uh, how old is that? That's like. For me. Uh, uh, Dude, how old is that? It's like 78 or something. That's yeah. like, I couldn't believe it. I heard it was like on a Mark Wahlberg movie. I was like, holy shit. Hey, man, they got, a, they got someone, uh, they got a new, uh, someone's, someone's repping their catalog, man. They're I probably, guess. You know, a lot of people are selling their pub these days. And then yes. all these, again, these catalogs are just pumping out. You know, they have, they have control of these masters now and you're seeing more license happening now. Yeah. I just saw David Crosby was the latest sort of like big name to sell his uh, catalog yeah. last week. Yeah, no, it's um, happening a lot. That's a, it's a big thing. Everybody's cashing out because no one really knows the future. They're all taking the money. It's smart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lost in Texas. Love that song. It's like a, uh, as my notes, a cool barroom brawl blues rocker. Blues rocker in my New York yeah. is coming out there. Uh, love the harmonica. You almost never hear harmonicas anymore in rock. Like back in the day, you'd hear cool, you know, uh, Robert Plant. Just everybody would like whip out a harmonica, you know. Yeah, it's um, so cool you said that, Robert Plant, because because uh, well, well, Stacy Collins, Al, Al Collins, our bass player, his wife, Stacy Collins, is um, she's a great singer too, but she plays great harp. So that and, was her. Yeah, so she came and played. She guessed it on that, and um, it's great that you said Zeppelin because, dude, when I was um, when I was mixing that song, um, that was a challenging song because we did the drums first back in, in this room right here. <laughs> we did the drums here, and it just, you know, it's the only song we did here, and it just kind of, eh, it just didn't have any depth. It's like, yeah, it was a low ceiling, a touch of ceiling. Uh, it didn't have any depth and everything. So that was one of the last songs we went back and tracked the drums at the studio at the very end of the album, and. Um, and I remember like, you know, it's just, it had this energy uh, it, when I was doing the, the you mentioned Zeppelin, um, I made a mistake. I had two, three of Stacy's harmonica parts and I had them layered in three different tracks and I had one of them and I just played it back one time and I, I it just had this, it just, it does, what it's doing on the recording is what it did. Like when I did it by accident, it just had this like this hook that came back every time and it was like this zeppelin -y kind of thing in my head you know i was trying to create the zeppelin thing and it, it kind of just happened by accident which it is so cool. cool yeah so the way that the there's like three harmonicas going on that very riff which kind of creates the tension of what it is it's really interesting i can't describe why it works it, it sounds it, great it just works yeah it's it's so she did a great job and i was fortunate enough to be able to put it together that's awesome. Uh, were you, were you, the song's called Lost in Texas. Were you really lost in Texas? <laughs> we were definitely, and we, we, um, we spent a lot of time. We did like Lubbock, Amarillo, San Antonio, Dallas, Houston. I mean, we, we, I mean, we must have played 12 places in Texas. It's a huge state. Yeah, man. Uh, and, we we were so lost so many times, but you know we didn't really care. <laughs> you know, loss is actually pretty fun. Um, I remember one time in Texas there was a huge hailstorm. They had these big hails that like dented our van. I remember our tour van was all the whole roof was just dented from the from the hail. Wow! In the middle of like um, middle, we were just driving. It was like a flat plane. All of a sudden, doo -doo 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 -doo, it just started coming down for like oh my god! Like that's really weird. Yeah. Um, so we, we were, we had some crazy uh, times in Texas, man. People in Texas are, are a real, um, it's a fun place to play. <laughs> yeah. Very it's cool. a fun place to play. Great people. <clears throat> um, I'm like really basic with guitar. I don't run a lot of effects. Uh, and you didn't sound like, I, that's why I really like the, the, your guitar in there. It sounds like you're not running tons of effects on there throughout the record at all. I didn't hear that. Right? yeah no it's pretty straight uh pretty pretty straight through i'm pretty much relying on each guitar to kind of um paint the um the, the palette or to paint the picture um you know it was interesting trying to find all the right guitars for the right parts because that's the key with production is like okay this guitar is great for single note parts from 12th fret up to the 15th fret this guitar is great for um, double stop chords between frets nine. And I mean, you have to, I, that's how I think of it as very systematic. So you have to, like all guitars aren't intonated equally. So that guitar doesn't sound good there. So you have to find all these things that make it all, it's like a big puzzle um, and just finding all the pieces. And um, I, I don't, 
I don't really like to record with effects because I feel like unless I'm going for a, for a specific sound, if you're committing to something, great. But generally, you want to keep it a little bit open ended so you don't have to necessarily commit for later on when you're mixing. You don't have to be so stifled unless, it's, of course, it's a vision that you're going for. Right. Right. Let me ask you a question. Um, is there any chance that is an old fender there, correct? Yeah. Is there any chance you could play something through that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to hear you play. I'd love to hear your playing through that. Amp, see what if, for, if, if you don't mind, just if you're going to play something that you wrote, just make sure you own publishing because I'll pull it off. Oh, this. no, I'm not going to. Oh, right? yeah. Just riff. That would be so cool. Yeah. I won't, I won't play anything. Uh, I, man, yeah. that's very kind of you. I appreciate you taking the time. I just, yeah, yeah. I've been looking at that amp and I'm looking at all your guitars and I love your guitar sound. And I'm like, man, let me just see if you be open to it. Thank you. Yeah, let's see what we got. Uh, that's the one I was hoping. I didn't want to say anything, but that's the one I was hoping. Yeah, this is, a, this is the new one, man. This is the one uh, <laughs> I bad. just picked up, man. Um, this is uh, the 61 um, the Heavy Relic, Heavy Relic Strat. Um, it's is, what is that, like Seafoam Green or Daphne Blue? Yeah, this guess? is a Surf Green, actually. Surf and, um, Green, yeah. From what I learned, uh, they did a nice job on it because uh, the real ones, the authentic ones from really from the 60s, after time, from what I've read and learned, is that they um, – they um they turn a little bit more blue after time and that green kind of fades away so the relic that they did is pretty nice on this guy they what is the it. difference between a 61 and a 62 because you usually see like 62s um if you even know a 61 and 62 i don't you know i think it might be some of the neck the neck radius um, okay um the neck radius might be different Man, I gotta tell you, the amps aren't even coming on here. <laughs> well, if it's not coming on, don't worry about That's it. So man. crazy, dude! I might have to plug into the Randall for you. <laughs> there you go. Uh, hold on. I mean, I'm honestly, yeah. I don't know why. I think it's like, like, oh shoot, the fuse. Okay. Yeah, well, so. Well, this will have to be another day. Yeah, man. Don't worry hold about on. it. I just put the fuse back in. I'll play through the other one. You be like. Man, the amp was great. That guy Garber asked me to play. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. karma flew the fuse. Is right. that the Randall? Yeah. So check this out. Yeah. So then the pickup selection, this is the other. Is that too loud? <laughs> no, it sounds fine, man. <laughs> Yeah, turn turn the volume down just a little bit now. Let's see. So this thing this thing smacks this guitar like. What a what a stratty sound, man! What 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 pickup? What what's your, where's your pickup selector there, man? Um, this is on the bridge. And the one thing about this guitar is that. Most strats are very tinty on the um on the high on the on the bridge pickup. Um, this is made. This was a Wildwood. Um, it was done by Wildwood out of Colorado. And yeah. Hand wind their own pickups. And I read I read about this a little bit. And a friend of mine referred me to call them, and and I just took a, took a shot. I didn't even play this guitar. I just bought it sight unseen. I mean, I just went for it, and it just kind of happened to be a great thing. But the Wildwood pickups. I mean, if you wasn't. <laughs> and that's the bridge pickup yeah wow and because yeah. wow yeah and then this is the this is the middle uh, Has that stratty kind of makes you play like, uh, you know, and then the yeah, it's like, you know, this has a great, oh, dude, yeah, that sounds great, man. I didn't know they wind their own pickups at Wild, but that's cool. Yeah, it's because so they, they they so it's kind of got this this attitude to it. I love the uh, it's just for chords. Yeah. Wow, 
oh, that's got that, ah, you know, you hear the honk, right? Like right in yeah, there, man. That sounds great. Character. And then it also gets really pretty and like, you know. Great, man. Yeah, but you get the idea, right? Yeah, man. Very cool. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. And thanks for showing. Just got to do it. I literally like, I love the guitar so much that I'll, I'll, I'll take breaks. I'll like, I'll be working. I'll say, I'm just, I want to take a break. I'll come back here. I'll just sit here and play, you know? And I never used to do that. Like just on guitar. I mean, that's how inspiring that thing is. That's cool, man. Yeah. So I've not, I haven't had a guitar like that for quite a while. So that's your number one. You know what? Turn up the volume a little bit now. What's that? If you could turn up your volume a little bit now. On here? Yeah, because it, it's not as, it's lower It's for some reason. Maybe I'm just, maybe because we had the guitar. <laughs> wow, you yeah, seem that, lower. Is that any better now? Let's see, hold on. Yeah. Audio and professional yep. sitting right here. Yeah, okay. there you go. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, is that so, your number yeah, one? That's your number one right now? I would, yeah, at, at the moment, it definitely is number one because it's the newest and um, it's it's definitely, I always wanted a, the seafoam green or the surf green. I always wanted that sound. The only guitar that I'm looking for now is a, I'm going to try to find a Les Paul Jr., um, an older one, like 59 or 60, 61. Yeah. That's my next, my next investment. But it, other than that, I'm pretty pretty set. Um, I have a good gamut of everything. That's cool. Um, what, what's number two and three for you, guitar-wise? Hmm. Number two is probably my, um, I would say my duo jet. My I have a 56, 1956 duo jet, um, Gretsch. And... Um, it's got the George Harrison Beetle kind of um, thing. It doesn't have the Bigsby on it. I mean, do you want to see it? If it's handy, yeah. If, if it's, it's not, right no worries. It's a beaut. You got to see it. Thanks, man. This is cool. I appreciate you taking the time to do that. It's worth looking at, man. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. It's going to run out and open the case and I'll be good. <laughs> no, all good, man. all right so this guy wow that is a pretty guitar man yeah i've never played a gretsch how do they yeah it's like, like a it's a it's such a um i can't it's got a thing about it. it's like an old like it's like an antique car this thing it's just the beauty um yeah it's I a found beautiful it the guitar center in south bay man I, this is on the wall i paid like two grand for this thing like years ago it's amazing beautiful guitar man um that's a 56 a Gretsch is like a, it's a 56, yeah. Um, it's, it's got a, it's a very, um, with the, 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 the pickups in it um, are very, they're very lively in a way they'll squeal. It's a, you have to, it's a very difficult guitar to play um, in a live situation with distortion. Uh, so you have to be very, um, you can't, it's not one of those, you know, you have to really be like conscious of your distortions and stuff. So it's a little tricky, but it's got such a, a warmth and a, and an old sound to it through a Vox or through a, a matchless or something. It definitely, it sounds like if you play like um, a Beatles song, you kind of get that sound, you know, it has that feeling, you know, it's just you, you, the characteristic of what they were doing back. Cause it's old and the wood is yeah. really, 56 it's just, god it's nice seeing cool. things older than me for a change and i had this guitar and um when i went to compass point with the tories and we were doing our album i we got to meet terry manning um producer producer he, yeah he um he uh eventually showed us his vault of guitars in the back and he pulls one out of the same guitar but like, oh my god we looked at it ours are six there's six numbers off from one another serial number wise i couldn't believe it that's wild that's yeah. really what is the chances? That's very yeah. random. Yeah, we so so here we are in, in the Bahamas, you know, comparing guitars that were made pretty much in the same week or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or uh, whatever. Um, and then he had he had this Rally X. Uh, he had done Zeppelin too, man. He had this Rally X that Jimmy Page gave him. It's a Gretsch Rally X. I begged him to let me buy it from him. I just wouldn't do it. It was the greatest guitar. Wow. But it, was, it was amazing. It was such a beautiful guitar. Very cool. So you got 61 reissue strat. What's and your 56 duo? What's your number three? Um, I would say it's a toss up between uh, the Les Paul 60 reissue and uh, I have a, a Tele 60 reissue of both of those. Um, they're both great guitars, depending on what, what you're looking at. Sure. But I, I love those two guitars as well. What's the uh, 
best guitar and best amp you've ever played through? Best amp? Um, I'd have to say this this Randall RG80, man. I mean, wow. I, I, Serious. I That's... don't use any other amp. I used the Matos the other day because I was going for some different tones because I wanted to mix it up for the recording. But I really, I really gravitate. It just makes me happy and it gets me where I want to go. There's something with the frequency of it for recording. When you record with this Randall, the frequency of the tone, like the frequency that it records with, it, it, it when you have the track, it just fits right into the track. I can't explain it. There's a wow. certain thing that they nailed that is probably un, un, unheard of, actually. But the fact that the frequency in, in which it records actually is really easy when it comes to recording. If you have your bass and drums sitting in the right places, this guy just comes in at just the right place to fill in the right frequencies. It's really weird how it works. That I love cool. that. I love my mattress. I have a mattress DC 30. That was um, another amp that I love. So those two are my, I would say my go-to or my favorite amps I ever played through. Um, when we were, when we were in um, Atlanta um, with the Tories, we were at, um, uh southern tracks making okay. our album there and brendan o'brien at the time was doing stone temple pilots and all that stuff and pearl jam and all those bands and um we got to check out his collection so i have to say some of his amps and guitars were pretty awesome like i remember playing through some of those we used them for our album and stuff and i was like ooh, we had a i remember this uh it was like one of those little fender like little what are they champs like a and fender champ or fender pro jr yeah, Pro Junior. That was it. Yeah. And it was in the hallway of the, the studio, and and it was a long corridor hallway. And I'll never forget the sound we got with that within the hallway. It was unbelievable. Like Loads of guys love the Pro. Really Junior. cool sound. So yeah, those are yeah. great. Yeah, Pro Juniors are amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, was was any chance Rodney Mills was the engineer on that? No. What was his name? Um, Ryan Williams was his name. Okay. Ryan Williams was the engineer at Compass. You know what's so funny too that that whole Compass, uh, not Compass Point, Southern Tracks studio went out of business in Atlanta. I recently was at a studio here in LA, and and I'm sitting there in the studio, I'm looking around, and I'm looking at the monitors of the headphone amps, and it says Southern Tracks on it. And I'm like, oh my god! I looked up, I went to console, and sure enough, they moved the whole studio out here. So it's in um, it's in Burbank right now, pretty much the console and all the gear from Southern tracks that used to be in Atlanta. I guess the owner had passed away and it got sold and it, all, all the gear came out here now. So it's really interesting that I was in this other place. And like, yeah, that is wild. You know, it was really weird. They had a drum room that had glass. I'm, in front of it. Okay. So and I know, I know this whole, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'll tell you. It, it was a drum room that had glass in front of it, which is really odd because I've never seen a studio like that before. And then this new studio that I went into the, one of the first signs because we went into the studio entrance into the main room first. I didn't see the, the control room. The first thing I saw was in this Burbank place was a glass drum room. I'm like, what? So that like kind of gave it away. And then as I started going further, I started looking and sure enough, <laughs> it was all Southern tracks. And they had the same kind of setup for the drum room. I'm like, okay. It was like a long, the Southern tracks was like a long, narrowish sort of place. Yeah. 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 So Rodney Mills was the, what did some work and then they went to studio one it became studio one i think over in atlanta which is still okay. uh, which then went out of business after that but i i i'm just i've had guys come to the show that have recorded there and so i've i've heard that it's a great place and yeah so, what, a, what a nostalgic place that, that i mean we had geez crazy man that was a really really wild time we worked with the guy we worked with a guy named nick dia and it didn't work out with him so we had to end up stopping where we were and then we went to the compass point and finished the album uh, we were in in the bahamas for like a month doing the album out there we redid the vocals we just made it kind of going we just had a little bit of creative differences in atlanta at the time so we had to move so uh, so we had a great time there while we were there and we got to you know got to be in the whole brennan o'brien space which is all those great amps and guitars and you know the stone temple pilot sounds and all those pearl jam things that they were doing that was just really cutting edge at the time it was really fun to be around that that's cool man Tell me the last thing you listen to musically, like on your iPhone or wherever you listen to music, what you listen to oh, most recently. Oh man, I just listened. Someone sent me this uh, this Billie Eilish song that she had in um in the in the James Bond movie, and I and I guess Hans Zimmer was part of like, he he was part of the production, and so I got into that. So I just listened to that. That was kind of interesting. I really I love the whole Phineas uh, Billie Eilish. I like what they're doing um, sonically. They're doing something so different than anybody else which is very cool. So I'm always intrigued by them. And 
I just listened to, uh, I've been actually kind of reviewing guitar players lately. I've been going, uh, I just did a toss up between, um, I picked all my favorite guys like from the day, like I picked Eddie, Nuno, Steve I, um, who else? Um, Paul Gilbert, um, I don't know, you name them, some of the guys. And I started just doing my thing, just doing my thing. You're like doing a March Madness thing of, your, of guitars? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like looking, yeah. looking at like watching all these videos. And I have to say, to this day, my favorite guy still, I think, is Nuno Betancourt. Is I don't know how to say it. The dude is a freaking monster. I like, we saw him at, um, it was like a couple years ago at NAMM, I guess. It was a after show. They did a show over in, um, in the Disney area, I think at the House of Blues Extreme played. And um, I got to see, you know, Nuno, not, we used to have the same guitar endorsement. We were endorsed, endorsed by Washburn Guitars, and so was Nuno back in the day for Extreme. So we kind of crossed paths a little bit. I actually signed a Nuno autograph one time at a NAMM show when these fans came up to me. I thought I was Nuno. So instead of, discouraging, funny. Them, instead of discouraging them, I said, get the funk, get the funk <laughs> Nuno Betancourt. I, yeah. literally, I took pictures with him and everything. That's but so funny. Them. That's awesome. Um, That's but, classic. But I, did like a, I did like a Nuno thing. And that, so I, I, I still to this day, I think Nuno, his right hand is so phenomenal. His like his rhythm. I mean, yeah, he's a phenomenal lead player more than anybody ever, but his rhythm, man, and his solid, like his, he blows me away, man. He's like, to this day, he's like, by, I mean, Steve, I obviously is a whole other level of Zen, but there's many, there's many facets of other players that obviously will take people in different directions. But as far yeah. as like, someone who just, for me personally, just still moves, man, I'm blown away by Nuno, man. I don't know what it is, man. Just incredible. That's awesome. T tell me your top three Desert Island discs. Oh, geez. Uh, just, just for right now. Not, not like, you know, see, do I have any, I'm trying to think if I had any, um, anything like, I would say, desert island like if i was like if that was it that was the end of the then it, i would you know it's funny my wife and i love um uh meatloaf bad out of hell so i'd have to say that bad out of hell because i could sing like every word of every song every <laughs> song i mean we used to sing it like we drove to california and we sang like every word and it's kind of a cheesy album but it was part of my childhood and yeah you know, it's kind of had the whole broadway kind of thing going on with jim steinman and all that but um yeah so that one would probably be there i would say zeppelin physical graffiti would be a good one to pull on that you know if i was deserted um only because i jimmy page and zeppelin sound to me to this day i'm still so blown away by how amazing they sound like like i knew they were amazing back when they were doing their thing but now when you listen to their recordings and the feel of the sum of their parts and the feel that they had was just mind boggling. It blows my mind, like how yeah. great that was. So just the feel. So that, I would say Van Halen 1, man. <laughs> Van Halen 1, the, the energy of Van Halen 1, oh my God. Like, like there's so many mistakes on that album. It's just raw and live and it just, it just, it just pumps you up, man. It makes you just want to go do something and get you excited. It's just the energy of it's amazing. So I love the energy of that. Very cool. Thank you uh low points jj what were some of the low points or dark periods that you've had to deal with in uh your life and how'd you get through them um i i'd, I'd say like i don't i don't really i can't say i had a ton of low points fortunately i'm very fortunate um um some of the lower points were just just being rejected um you know and learning how to deal with the rejection um and and bouncing back from that, <clears throat> bouncing back from those rejections. And it's not necessarily a low point, but it's certain, something that kind of like it, it drags you down and it potentially could put you to a low point if you let it. Um, yeah. And um, bouncing back and just being, um, um, being, if you have a vision in your head, being living up to yourself, you know, um, is, is so hard to do living up to what you want to be or what you envision yourself being, you know? So getting to that place, like getting, getting there and being confident and being confident in my craft enough that I know right now that if someone were to call me to ask me to do a project, I can do it with confidence and send them something and be happy building that, like, like the, the struggle to get to that point. It's, it's maddening because you have all these opportunities, you lose gigs, you lose money opportunities. And until you're ready to take that on, it's just impossible to kind of, you know, so the struggles, I would say, um, was getting to the point where you want to be, you know, so you can do what you, you always wanted to say you could do, but getting there is so hard, man. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. <clears throat> uh, I want to talk about, I know you, your mom got you hip 
you talked about visualization earlier and your mom got you hip to that at a young age. I was curious. I'm a firm believer in that. And I think the more you can, and I always study self-development stuff, anything I can that, you know, that might work, you know, right. uh, talk about the context that she initially presented this concept to you and maybe talk about one or two situations uh, that you've used this technique over the course of your life. You mentioned one earlier as far yeah, as mom, mom was into um, a lot of uh, astrology and uh, uh, she was into, she got readings done um, and she was very much spiritually into a lot of cool stuff. And two things mom kind of helped me with, well, mom always taught me to visualize. Um, when I was really young, she would say stuff like, okay, if you're going to go to, to see the, Ozzy at the Coliseum, imagine yourself being up there playing guitar, but visualize yourself being up there. I would literally go to the concert, you know, being a young kid, listening to mom, and I would see myself up there. I remember seeing uh, Ozzy with Jake e. Lee uh, opening up Metallica, open up for them on the Ride the Lightning. And um, um, I remember seeing Jake, and the whole time, like I was right in front of his amp. I remember it was pierced my ears. The whole time, I remember, like, I was there, I was on stage. When I saw Steve Vai on stage, I saw and whoever it was, I, like, I would always envision myself up there doing that. When I used to watch um, um, videos on MTV, like as the video generation, like just started, you know, the first videos were coming out and everything. I used to like always with mom's advice, I used to always visualize myself in the video. Like, and I, like one of the weird things when Nelson came out, like after the rain or whatever it was, I don't know who the guitar player was. There's one guy, he had darker hair. He's like the rhythm guitar player. That was me in the Nelson video. That was me the whole time. And ironically, I came out to LA years later and I played shows with Nelson. I played the, the Ryman Auditorium with them. I went to Nottingham, England. I played with Nelson. I've done it. It's like the fact that you can visualize something when you're a kid and then later make it happen. That it's undescribable to me. I don't know. This has happened to me in so many different ways. Like so many different little things from yeah. my friend um, Dan Simmons and I used to always like go to this record store in Ohio. We used to discover new bands all the time. Every Wednesday they had new music and we discovered Queen's Reich, Queen of the Reich. I remember yeah, that. I remember that. Yeah. Four song EP. That was one of the ones he gave to us. And we just were instant Queen's Reich bands. And like later on in life, I get to meet Jimbo Barton, who produced all those big albums, who, you know, um, he did Silent Lucidity and like Empire. He did all those albums. And so here I am working with this guy. So Scott Rockenfield, we're friends now. We've done tons of cues together for trailers. I mean, he's an amazing composer. Um, and I used to I used to watch Scott. Like, I remember buying the Queen's Rec video when I was a kid. They have this live video of them playing somewhere. I think it was Japan. Or, and Rockenfield was always my favorite part of the band. He was like, he was like the, the shiznit of that band. I'm sorry. I know Jeff Tate was great, but Scott Rockenfield was always the standout of that band. And and I always envisioned like, God, it'd be so great to play with that guy or hang out, you know, and cer certainly it came, it came around, you know what I mean? So there's this weird thing, man, it's visualization. Um, I really believe if you visualize something, you create something in your head, you can really make it happen, but you have to really believe it. <laughs> you have to really believe it. A um, couple of questions. Yeah, I that Operation Mind Crime, that's one of the best albums ever made to me, man. Right. That's just a freaking amazing record. Yeah, um, yeah. What have you done the same thing with your kids, like teaching them about visualizing? Yeah, I do. I, I, I don't preach it, but I certainly, um, I certainly talk about things like, you know, positive, um, what you put into the universe and my thoughts, it, it comes back to you. I mean, hands down, you put bad in the universe, bad comes right back at you. If you, if you send good, good vibes and good waves. So I, I try to talk about that a lot yeah. uh, in addition to visualization, Visualizing yourself being in a situation is hard to do, but then making it actually come to fruition is the, is, is, is so overwhelming when it happens, you know, and it, it takes so much drive to, to, to get that, uh, to get to where you want to be. And then also you have to put yourself in the situation to succeed as well. Of course. Um, um, but um, I do, I do teach my, I talk to my kids about, um, trying to visualize and, and things like positive enforcement, positive energy, being kind, being good. I said, some of the people that are the most successful people in the music industry are the people that have the greatest attitudes. It's not necessarily the greatest players. It's not necessarily the greatest guitar player. It's about who's got this great attitude that someone's going to want to sit in the tour van with them for like three months. Yeah. 
and like, you know, deal with this person. You don't want someone who's in there going, you know, you can't, I mean, no one wants uh, to be around that guy. I don't care nope, if he's the greatest now. player in the world. It doesn't yeah, yeah. matter. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter. You want to be that guy. Like uh, I have a, a friend, um, who I've known for quite a long time, Phil X, uh, who now plays with Bon Jovi. Sure. Like I tell everybody, I go, dude, Phil is the most talented, ridiculous guitar player. He's like a mentor. I like, I idolize watching him. And um, cause he's just so great, but his attitude, man, when you talk to him and when you like, you, he's, he's infectious. It's an infectious thing that, that I think is the key to success. I really do. Yeah. I think your attitude has everything to do with success. Totally. Yeah period <laughs> but i think that the visual i i i wish i had gotten hip to that earlier because i think there's a lot of struggle to become successful but if you in your head already saw it happen i can't attest to this but i would imagine the path there is fraught with less resist self-resistance mm -hmm. yes it is um it's definitely um less self-resistance because you are you are you have this go on this vision that you just, you're not going to stop, man. You're not going to stop, you know, just the way it is. I mean, like I said, again, Kobe Bryant, I'm a big sports guy coming from Cleveland. My dad got me into sports at an early age. The, the competitiveness of Kobe always drove me, man. Like, like just being competitive, man. I, I'm often in a situation where I could put up against 10 other guys to get a gig, like, mm -hmm. like whether it's, composition whether it's auditioning for bands like when i auditioned for bands dude every single audition i ever went for i always got honest yeah. to god because i in my head before i before i started I, I was getting the gig before i even got it right i'll never forget man like moving into tory's audition <laughs> there's a guy named like the guy i literally was helping him move his shit out of the way as fast as i could so i could set my stuff up because he was he was before me i'm like okay you're done I'm setting my shit up now. They're never <laughs> going to turn back. I mean, that's just my, in my head, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so basically that's just the, it's just that attitude. It's not cockiness. It's just confidence and confidence isn't something that I had in my whole life. I had to work on that. It's building your confidence as a human and as your abilities to, um, to, to do what you do, um, whether it's composition writing, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're confident in your own head, I think then you can exude confidence to others and help others and help help other people strive to be better. And then from that, I think it's just a big growth pool of success. Everybody, everybody wants to be a board. You know, people used to say to me like, wow, you've been working with that guy for 12 years or it's amazing. You can keep these relationships. Your attorney's been with you for this. It's like, yeah, when you find people that you work with that it's, it works, man, you just stick with it and you go with it. You don't try changing all the time. You stick with what works for you. You have to be, um, you have to, to seek what works for you. And then hopefully you can find these elements and then just hang on to them and kind of work, help them, let them work for you, you know? Yeah. And I think it's important in that too, for me anyway, I've found that relationship is really important that it's, it's, it, you both have to want that. It's like, you've been married a long time. I've been married a long time. You both have to work there, man. Now it's anyway. not going to be a hundred. It's not going to be 50, 50. It's not going to be tit for tat, but there has to be a mutual agreement of, man, this is a beneficial thing for me. I like this person. I'm, I want to give. And I think as long as that giving thing is there first, it's really not that hard to. Well, Craig, you just you know? say on any, any relationship as you just, any relationships work, man, you know, it, it, you have to know that going into it, band relationships, bands are work too. You have to, it's the same thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, like any any relationship that any if you're working for a company it's like relationships are key but you have to understand that if you're not willing to work on a relationship it'll probably won't work because it's a constant reinvention a constant work and in, in progress you know any relationships constant. yeah well it's funny because i've i've met guys over the years and i've and they yeah, people say how did you stay married i said well we, we've worked it he goes oh he goes if i have to work with my wife i don't want to do it i'm like well, you're in fucking la la land. That's, that's, that's <laughs> good luck. With, that's, good luck with that. That's good selfish, luck with man. doing that's, that's, nothing that's, and that's, having your relationship. But work. that's but that's the that's the difference, though. That's the difference. It's like that mentality will stop somebody from getting to to the next little that little point that could necessarily change everything, but they don't know it because yeah. they can't get to that next point yeah. to open up that other door to open up the next door. They, it's just. It's an accumulative thing. You have to just yeah. kind of, it's very, very visionary, man. I think you have to kind of, 
you know, you have, and you to, have to constantly it. push what you, you have to constantly be give, 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 constantly yeah. do like, Oh, like whatever it takes. And you have yeah. to also know what situation you're in to know, okay, I'm not going to make a ton of money here, but if I know, if I spend my time, I spent three days on this and, and I know that I pull off what I know I can make and I can make sound that my investment of my three days, even if it's only a hundred bucks, is going to be worth my time because that person is going to then see what I can do and accept me into their world in a different kind of light than in just a guitarist or just this. You have to kind of go the extra mile sometimes to prove yourself. I'm still proving myself at 50 years. I'm still like having like to prove myself. Like right. I, I can do this with my eyes closed, but I know that you know that I can't do it. So here, let me prove it to you. You know, right, you, right. Kind of, you have to like show them. And then once you do, you earn that trust. Right. And then the trust is a bond that you can't break after you earn it. You can't break it, but it's earning the trust. <clears throat> yeah. I agree with you, man. Very much. So um, along those same lines, tell me JJ, one or two things that you you've done or one or two changes you've made that have had the biggest impact on your life could be personal growth wise, professionally, spiritually, anything that was important to you at the time that might've changed your life. Um, I would think like, um, uh, being in a collaboration with um jimbo um barton um i met jimbo um his name is james barton but he goes by jimbo um why jimbo, do so many guys in the music industry that are jim go by jimbo it's really quite a, kind yeah, of right? funny he came in i met him at the first he actually when i auditioned for the tories i was saying i i took that guy's stuff and i was packing his shit um <laughs> jimbo was actually there for the very my first audition like he was at we, we it's so funny we rehearsed at the rehearsed at the first Presbyterian church in, in Hollywood. So, so here we are. In it's a, a wild place. Yeah, to, like right, yeah. in, right in the middle of Hollywood. Our singer worked there. He was, he, he was a maintenance there. He, he, he cleaned okay. the place up. That was his job. So we had this room. So we were in like a classroom rehearsing. So Jimbo was there and we were the two new guys. Like I had just come in. That was my first audition. I had just gotten the gig. Jimbo, um, Jimbo, or, or no, I was on for the gig and Jimbo was there to, to produce. He had heard the band um, at, at the Coconut Teaser and he was interested in producing. He was going to do a demo for Sony. So I'm walking right in. I joined the band doing a demo for Sony with Jimbo Barton, you know, playing at the house. So it was like a walking right in this great situation. But Jimbo, him and I, man, during the time of making that, that Tory's demo that I'm talking about, it was at my house because I had a studio and I literally sat all night with him. And he was the kind of guy that would work all night, like literally till sunrise. And I would just sit there by his side for like, I sat there for weeks, just watching him do what he was doing and learning from him and stuff like that. Just blown away. He was doing this on D88s before Pro Tools and all this. Um, so it was all done on D88. So he knew all these tricks and he would offset the machines and he would, he would do all these things that I just never knew that were possible um, to do with any machines, let alone D88s. Um, so he, his influence, um, he, he changed my life and we worked for, 12 years together every day after that man we became wow. he, he was at my house every day i actually bought an ssl console uh i had an ssl e-series console in my room for about 10 years to accommodate jimbo so jimbo would then be able to mix and do what he do, do, does from my from my house and rather than us having to go to a room for 500 bucks at midnight because we're getting a cheap rate you know because right. we're going to the record plan or wherever um so I, I brought the console to us. There's a, there a, a guy selling one and I, I happened to get a good deal on it. We set it up. It was the craziest thing I've ever done. But then, so we were, we were working on 30 Seconds to Mars. Like in 2011, we did eight 30 Seconds to Mars shows. We, meaning Jimbo would go record them, bring it back to here. We would do all the post-production here. And then we would mix the show here. You know, we won for Hurricane for top video um, that year. We won audio. We won some awards. So that was all going and everything. And it was cranking. So Jimbo, man, like... Like seeing him behind a console, like he was like the controller of the mothership, you know, it's like Han Solo and the and the fucking Millennium Falcon. <laughs> like he was just like he was in control of this console, like Ugh! you know, like like it just blew me away, man. Like like his his influence. So I would say he's probably my biggest mentor, biggest influence, um, you know, that I can ever um, acquire. And yeah, there's nobody bigger than him, really. <clears throat> Very cool, man. Thank you. Uh Best decision you ever made, JJ? Uh, getting married to my wife. But, um... Yeah, she uh, she gave me a pretty heavy ultimatum like early on, which now um, wasn't an ultimatum, but it was like I think she was envisioning the future too. So she's yeah. like, she's like, you need to plan B. Oh shit! 
what's the plan B? You know, at the time I was just right. a guy, rock and roll, drink beer. What? Plan B? What does that mean? You know? And so I started considering that. And that's when I started getting into composition and really seeking music libraries. And my plan B was that. And I, yeah, it, it took years for that plan B to now what now is plan A. Plan A. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I have to say um, my wife, uh, as hard as that was for me to accept and as much as I hated hearing it, um, I certainly, uh, uh, she's, I've become such a better person. Like I can't even tell you. It's, it's funny. That's one of those things like your wife would tell you and you'd be like, okay. But like if your mom or dad tell you like, fuck that, I'm not, I'm, I'm <laughs> right. Cause you know, exactly. I just thought of it. Cause like my, even my wife, this happens with, or, or my kids, you know, they're older now and, uh, they'll say, Oh yeah. You know, I learned about this and I'm like, and I've been telling you this for 25 years. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or my wife will say, "Did you know?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I've been, we've been talking about this." But they don't. Be, you have to hear the message from the right person sometimes to, you know. And that's everything, man. And you know, I'm, I'm happy. Here, I've, I've been drawn to, to type A personality women my whole life. My mom's a very type A personality, so everyone I either I'm married to a type A. Uh oh, something's I'm, about I'm, to explode. Is it eggs ready? <laughs> uh, you know, I've worked with all the type A's, you know, my, my, it's like, it's, it's just, I'm drawn to like powerful women. I mean, I don't know what it is, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, strong women, strong women, like, cause my mom, I guess, I guess, yeah. that's what it comes but, but also it's, it's, it's good. I consider myself, you know, strong in my own rights and I want to be with someone equally strong and, and I don't know what it is. It just, it just, it just, it just appeals, you know, and, you know, it's interesting. Uh, this is my second marriage. We've been together 28 years, but my, and my, I, I wanted a strong woman because I realized in my first marriage, I don't get down a lot, but if I do, I need, cause I'm a pretty strong person. I need a strong person to like, you know, kick my ass and say, Hey man. And yeah. so I, when I, that was like one of the, the strong, being a strong person, that was one of the drivers that attracted me to my wife initially. So I, I totally get that, man. It's yeah. invaluable, invaluable. <clears throat> What makes you happy? Um, family, smiles, good vibes, uh, video games, <laughs> uh, uh, getting up in the morning and creating something that didn't exist the day before. Yeah, man. I love that. I love getting up. You get an opportunity. Someone calls you, hey, can you do this? And then the next day you have this new thing that didn't exist the day before. And it's amazing. I think that you can just create these things on a whim. Um, that to me is happiness. Yeah. Being able to create, create something on a whim and, and let it be joyful and to other people as well. What do you like? This might be a tough question. What do you like most about yourself? <laughs> um, well, I guess my, uh, my ability to be a good dad to my kids, um, to be there for them. Actually, when I was, um, I was playing in a band with Matt Nelson, um, red 37 and um and this was right around my kids were small and everything and i remember making that decision i actually had a hernia surgery which kind of stopped me from singing really hard for a while because i was singing lead in this band and um in a kind of a combination of that and my kids i kind of made a decision i'm like i want to be there for my kids uh, i want them to know who i am because if i just tour and i just bail they're never going to know me and i want them to know me and knowing i had such a strong wife i knew i wanted to get my little you know i wanted to have a little bit of dad in there you know so being a good dad being positive um trying to trying to send good um things that make me happy like that i i don't know just just being positive trying to give my mom and dad a call every day that makes me happy uh, they still in cleveland yeah they're still in cleveland my dad's 91 Mom's oh awesome. shit man that's awesome haven't seen him for like a year and a half because it's because oh, of covid oh man so um, are they, so do they great. have their shots they do they got both oh, that's of their great. shots yeah, they're Great. they're um they're all vaccinated, so God bless them. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, man, just just happiness, man. I, I I don't know. I just I try to be positive. Just try to put good energy into the universe. I spent so many years putting bad energy into the universe, and nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting that you say that because I wouldn't have. Like just to know I you did. today, I wouldn't. I don't have... talk on it a lot, but I maybe I, that's why you read my bio and you're like, Craig, 
I get it. <laughs> no, I totally do. You, you're like, you're me and another, you're like my your brother from another mother, bro. <laughs> that's so funny. Cause I was I trying to figure that out. Cause I was like, man, this guy sounds like, that's really interesting. We'll talk about that afterwards. Man. That's really I can, interesting. I can, I can wear a good front man. Don't worry. Uh, but, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. I've had a lot of, man, I swear, if you put bad energy out there, it's awful, man. It really is. I've been there. <clears throat> it's so, so, it's awful for you. Forget yeah. about with everybody else, but it's yeah. like, it's like poisoning yourself, man. You've... <laughs> and this, it's cool. It's crazy because some people don't even realize that they're putting it out there and then they live their whole life in this negative state. And it's just amazing to me. Some people that are caught up into it. It's unfortunate, but it's about realizing, you know, who you are and, and, and what purpose do you have in your life? I mean, my whole thing now is like, what am I going to leave? What legacy am I going to leave? Do I want to yeah. be the guy who made a bunch of great tracks that, did the underscore for some, uh, some shows that no one's going to ever remember. Or, you know, I, 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 I put heavy burdens on myself. You know, I was having this conversation with my friend Holly the other day and we, she told me to watch um, the arrival of the movie about like getting, you know, getting things and being satisfied in your life and what you're going to leave. And what's it called? The arrival. Yeah. The arrival. It's a sci-fi movie. It's a, uh, uh, it's pretty interesting, but it's a really, you got to watch it. It's a pretty good, um, I won't tell you <laughs> just, just, it's worth watching about the okay. whole thing in, the, in, in your purpose in life and things that happen in your life that are happen for reasons and how they come back later. Um, and things. Um, so yeah. Um, you know, it's a great movie like that, man. What was that movie that, that in the, the, it took place in India about the kid who was on the game show. Uh, Oh my God! Um, not the one where he was on a boat. Uh, the one, of, not Pi, he, Life of Pi. No. No, he was a, a, a real poverty-stricken kid in India, and he wound up going on a game show. And every question they asked him had the answer was something he knew because of some traumatic experience he had had. Uh, God, it was a Slumdog Millionaire. Oh, okay. I remember that. I, haven't, I didn't see that, but I remember. Wonderful. That. Wow. It's like fantastic, wow. man. Yeah, just that, man. just like that. Uh, who's had the biggest influence on you musically and also personally? Um, I would think again, musically would go back to Jimbo. Jimbo. I mean, just because it's such a broad range of I, I learned so much from him. also Keith Olsen. Um I, I got to work with Keith Olsen. He was at my house for like six weeks every every day. I made an album with Keith Olsen and um, it was just him and I, and it was just mind boggling to be with such a legend first off. And then secondly, that he was actually working with me, you know, I was singing, I was like blown away by him. <laughs> um, he taught me so many lessons. Like, like he taught me, like when you're doing the guitar tracks, the cleaner the guitar is the sound of it, the bigger it sounds on the double when you do the doubles and everything. And I was always like, oh, I want to have you guitar sound with a distortion, but actually the cleaner it is, the bigger it sounds when you record it. And I kind of, knew that but he brought that full circle with me and also like stuff like in, in all the hit songs he's like man the most important thing for me when we were doing the hit songs like never lose your tempo like don't do a stop with no if there's a stop go t -t 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 keep a high keep something going t -t 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 keep something going so the listener never loses that thing so yeah that, kind of, that was driven into me so i have like a lot of the producers that i've met which i've met some great ones they've really had a big influence on me um, musically um, and stuff and guitar player wise um, Phil X is a big influence just um, we used to do um, uh, we worked together on Fox Sports we we used to work together on um, we did tracks for Fox Sports albums together and we've done a couple of trailers together um, that I brought him on in on and stuff like that we did um, Ice Age 2 and Ice Age 3 I think together oh, cool. um, so we we got some stuff going but um, um, so people I guess anybody anybody who's just influential at throne craft is influential to me i guess um you know so a lot of people um but but people that are just out there man anybody who's got something <laughs> something creative to put out into the world anything artistic you know um very cool you have any hobbies outside of music oh uh, i like to walk i love walking i love i can walk for my grandfather used to walk he was like he walked till probably he lived in 96 he used to oh, you got a lot of longevity in your family that's awesome yeah, he's, he he uh, he he used to wear a three piece suit and walk around. He lived in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. He used to walk around the city in a suit um, until he was like ninety two, um, just for miles every day. Get up and 
were his best in walk. And he was a walker. So I think I got a little of that from him. Love to walk. Um, I love video games. I've been a video game kid since I was like, you know, like I said, I used to flip over the games and the, the arcades and I used to have crowds of people. It was just, you know, I love all that stuff. What video game do you play? Um, I have um, Xbox. I, I usually gravitate towards um, the sports games. I'm a big Madden guy. Right. Um, uh, I do, you know, I do do delve into some adventure stuff. I don't like getting into the whole war games. It's a little bit too real for me. So I'm not down with like killing people and being in war, war situations. That's not my thing. Yeah. I'm like more into like, I like uh, Grand Theft Auto is fun. You know, like just stuff that's silly or just like non Somebody, hold on a minute. Like an escape, an escape. I don't want to be in a war thing in a game. I don't want to feel like in reality. I want to like, you know, I don't want to try to kill people. I want to, you know, well, I guess you kill people in games all the time, but you know what I mean? Somebody was telling me that, uh, who was telling me they play video games? I don't know, maybe Zach Alford, drummer. I don't know. He's because he was telling me he goes, I play with loads of other musicians. I just like I'm thinking, I wonder if you know him. If you guys play with him. I, I play this pool game. I mean, it's this little I play on my phone. Um, it's called just pool, I think. It's played by Mini Clip, is the name. I, I, I have like almost I think I'm up to 30 billion I've made on not not money, but just 30 billion in in I mean that's how much I play it. I mean, 30 billion in pool credits. In pool credits. So I'm freaking rich yeah, man. in the pool, pool world, yeah. man. Look out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, two more questions and thank you for everything, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, tell me about a specific experience that changed your life or changed the way you think about things. Yeah. Um, I would think the experience that changed my life would be the first time I hit an E chord on a guitar and threw a distorted amp. And you remember that, that, that distinctly. That, that's basically what, what, what it was. It was a store, a little music store, um, um, in my little hometown in Cleveland. And I went there with my dad and it was a little PV decade, little tiny little one speaker amp. And it was a, a Les Paul junior, a, a harmony Les Paul copy. And mm -hmm. I said an E chord and I had never heard, I, I, I had started on acoustic. My mom bought me an acoustic, um, to get me out of trouble when I was like, 12 or something like that and so i'd play acoustic i yeah whatever i played a couple of things i learned iron man on it and got into but when i first heard that uh, that e chord that changed my life and opening up kiss alive too <laughs> and looking at that just it changed my life that was it for me kiss alive too was it my whole room was kiss my my entire room was wall to wall not one space of white just constant posters tour programs whatever, man. I was the kiss guy. <laughs> I was, but, I was into that whole thing. It's funny guys like your age, that is, that's so common. And guys like that are 65 and up is all Beatles. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and kiss was such a big influence for, yeah. for guys in your target. It wasn't even like, it wasn't about the music, man. It was all about the image, man. They sold every kid, like not every kid, but kids in my, you know, 12 year old yeah. kids. It wasn't about the music, really. In fact, I, I saw an interview with Gene. Like he he basically claims that he ripped off everything on the album was a rip off of this is a stone song. He went through everything. Yeah, this is like a this is this song, this is this song. I mean, the guy was a genius. Gene's a genius. Oh, he's a sales machine, man. He's yeah. a brilliant, yeah. brilliant, yeah. brilliant guy, man. Really, he's a professor. He's a really smart guy. His name is I guess his name is real name is Gene Klein. He's a professor. He's never I know it's, I used to be so into them. Man. I know it's whole they used to take like four limos like when when kiss before they broke they used to show up at the concerts in new york one limo at a time one limo pulls up to the club while there's a line gene walks out another limo pulls up paul walks out another limo ace they literally did that for they built this mystique man they were they were they were genius they're from the and you know they're from the bronx or yeah. most of those guys genius. uh last question man and thanks again for everything jj uh, biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that change has been intentional and how much is a natural part of aging? Yeah, we talked about it a little bit. Um, just, just being selfless. That's being my selfless. biggest change in my personality. Um, and it has to do with kids. It has to do with having kids and, and, and giving everything to them and, and not, and not thinking it's all about you anymore. And, um, and that, that to me is the biggest biggest growth in the last 10 years, especially the last 10 years, my kids, you know, they're now 18, 17. So it's been a pretty, pretty awesome 10 years in that world, you know, sports and helping them develop things and just everything that they do. My, my daughter, one daughter surfs all the time. She's doing skateboarding and 
really fun just to watch them live their lives in, 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 in this California in landscape, you know, it's pretty. Amazing. Oh, that's right. that's right. Well, you know, it's cool over the next 10 years, it's going to be totally different because they'll actually come back to you and say, man, I really appreciate. Uh, wow. when, when, yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> it, it, like when my son, my oldest was 25, he came to me. That was the first time he used that. I got to tell you, I hated that every time when you, when I was younger, you tell me something, you were always right. I used to hate you for it. He right. goes, and now I come to you because you're always not, and I'm not always right by a long shot, but you know, yeah. it, at least he knows it's a safe answer. Like, you know, I have your best interest, you know, and they start realizing that and it's nice. You get the phone calls now, you know, my son will send me a met my younger one. Dad, this was like so moving. Uh, Dad, I'm so happy that I, you taught me what a good work ethic means. And I'm like, wow, that's nice. I mean, that was, uh, you know, but what do I say to that? Man? Well, that's, like, that's key. Uh, work work ethic is, is such a key thing, right? I mean, I, I, I didn't have a, a big work ethic type of childhood like that, but my wife being the type A personality, she's the work ethic part. I mean, that, so I understand all that. And that's, that's a great thing um, to, to, to teach kids, you know, to, to, cause, cause the truth is, man, when they're, when they're done with school or college or whatever, and they go out to the world, look how tough that that's. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I always was thinking in the back of my mind. Cause I never made it easy for them. They were like, well, you didn't get me a car. All my friends had a car. I'm like, okay, that's how life is, man. No one's getting you a car. <laughs> Good luck with that. You know? Um, yeah. but yet, you know, but oh, what I'm saying is over the next 10 years, if you've had a great relationship, it's going to get even better, man. It'll be, awesome. it becomes rewarding. Like your investment starts, you know, like you get some attaboys back for a change, you know, Let's change. I've already noticed some of the investment coming back, but I look forward to the next 10 years of that. That's good. That's cool, man. Hey, listen, let me tell people uh, where to find Slamming Gladys and more stuff on you. Okay, so Slamming Gladys, new album is called Two. It's a great record, and there's a couple of places you can get it. You can go to Slamming Gladys, S-L-A, it's slamming with an N, like S-L-A-M-M-I-N, Gladys, G-L-A-D-Y-S.com. Uh, on the on the website there is the first album remastered and also the new record in uh, digital format and on CD. Also, if you want to get some uh, cool Slam and Gladys merchandise, go to merchbucket.com. They've got uh, COVID masks, as I understand it, right? Everything COVID masks. Yeah, yeah, we, we have we have some masks on there. We have hats, masks, masks, uh, girl teams, uh, everything. That's that's all going. Yeah. What was that? Uh, and also uh, a lone recording of JJ singing Bad Out of Hell, I think is on there. Um, <laughs> hey, man. We're something if we can get that going. <laughs> also, if you want to check out uh, JJ's library and uh, all the stuff he's got going on with respect to licensing, I'm going to give you a couple of email address, a uh, couple of uh, domains. Go to Real Music, R E E L Music dot studio. Uh, on there, he's got tons of trailers and library samples. If you listen to the trailers and listen to how all that stuff works, and if you are interested in potentially working with JJ as far as in the trailer space or in doing some compositions together and maybe modifying an existing song on in your vein, uh, again, don't just do the homework first. Don't just like send them an email because it's real. Hey man, I want to do this. I'm do the homework. And then like, because if you don't do the homework and he's, it, he's not going to respond to you, but if you've done the homework, you're going to like send him a note that says, Hey, here's some music I have. I've listened to this. This is really something I'm interested in. And what do you think of this? Is this something that makes sense? Then he can come back and at least answer you. So please just do the homework. And you know, you want, if you're going to send him an email, which I'll give you his address in a second, show the guy that you've got a work ethic and that you at least put them time and energy into it uh and you can reach jj at jj at real music r-e-e-l music dot tv um and this is there anything else man that that we need to that's to great talk thank about? you so much no that's perfect that's wonderful. no that's cool um man thank you for your time anything any final words of wisdom final visualization oh, advice uh i would just yeah just uh words of wisdom man i would just say to you know as as times right now as hard as they are you know I would just say to try to get up every day and just appreciate being here and try to make a difference every day somehow, whatever that means. Even if you open a door for somebody, just be kind, man. Um, the world needs kindness right now, in my opinion, trying to like do whatever I can just to spread kindness and, 
try to, you know, I know that there's a, <laughs> I know it's a battle, but certainly um, as much as we can try to sp spread kindness and just inspiration to people and, you know, just try to, just to try to try to have a good time on life as much as we can every day. I agree with you, man. Thank you. That's really good advice. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to JJ Farris. Again, check out the new record, Slamming Gladys, S L A M M I N G I N, Gladys, G L A D Y S dot com, and Merch Bucket to buy some Slamming Gladys uh, merchandise. And check out JJ's licensing and library at real R E E L music dot studio. Uh, most important, man, remember that happiness, as JJ just said, is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play a guitar and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Brother, thank you so much for everything, JJ. Thanks, Greg. You got it.